just as you are before. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? Good morning. 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 Good morning.
Texas and all the crazy storms there, yeah. but uh, you know God is good and uh, he's, he's faithful, he's trustworthy, but most of all, he's here. Amen? Yeah. Right. <laughs>
circumstances in all situations, in the highs and the lows and the lightning storms. When all seems to be going just so perfectly well and smoothly as we think it should, and when everything falls apart. Help us never to forget that you said you would never leave us, never forsake us, that you are always with us to the very end of the age. We can trust you. And so, Lord, help us to acknowledge that in the way we conduct ourselves every day, the way we live in this world, this world that needs you desperately, in a place and a time where everything seems to be so topsy-turvy, sometimes feeling like it's riding on a razor's edge, help us to trust you. And so, Lord, we pray that that is our witness to the world, that we trust, we obey, because you're faithful and you're trustworthy. You alone are. And so, God, may you be honored in this place, in our lives, through this church, to the glory and the power of your kingdom. In your name we pray. Amen. 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 Take a moment, greet the folks around you this morning, welcome them here to West Shore. It's good to have a little bit of a chat with everybody, isn't it? That's, that's wonderful. So we're going to do the, the story, even though uh, no, none of the young people showed up today, but it does apply to us. And Pastor Steve said he was going to be talking about uh, God's presence. And after Moses um, had began to lead the children of Israel towards the promised land, you know how they then started into idol worshipping, calf worshipping, about Sinai, and then everything broke down. And Moses is here uh, praying to the Lord. And later on, God even shows Morgan, Moses his glory. Okay? But there's this beautiful passage. Actually, a song was made on this, but I, I wouldn't dare try to sing it. <laughs> the Lord, Moses was saying to the Lord, you know, begging him, will you go with us? And the Lord replied, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. And then Moses... <laughs> said to him, if your presence does not go with us, do not send us up from here. And sometimes if we want to go to the picture, now, oh, you can't see it, but Moses is on the left side, and he's walking alone in front of the people. As you know, sometimes the pillar of fire went before them at night, and a cloudy pillar by day but we all know there's times that I put this picture here because Moses doesn't look like anybody's with him. He's just walking ahead. I'm sorry the picture is kind of fuzzy. And yet God is, is there with him. And it made me think about Moses needed that presence to allay his fears. He needed that because he just said the burden is too great. There was a number of reasons why. And I can remember when I was, when we lived out in the Chosen, when I was a little kid, going into grade one, actually I started five years old because my birthday wasn't until September the 18th. So I started at five and we had to walk. If you know where the golf course is in the Chosen, we've had to walk even farther than that to get to the Chosen Elementary School. It was a good mile, all the way from a place called Lomax Road. And my mom was with our young, my, youngest, our, uh, my youngest brother, Gregory. We hadn't adopted our sister yet. And Gregory was only four years old. She had to stay at home. We had one vehicle. Dad had that in Victoria, uh, drove him to work. So I had to walk to school. And I was, and I was, and I was, uh, and I, and I was so bold. No, there's nothing wrong with walking to school, except I, you guys, was a big baby. I was so afraid. I was absolutely <laughs> terrified. And Michael and Leonard, my older brothers, they just took off, you know. 
And I didn't know what I was going to do. And so mom phoned up her next door neighbor. It was a girl my age, starting grade one, named Wendy. And she, she wasn't afraid. And she said, she said, that's okay, I'll go with Ronnie. And you guys, all the way to school, she helped me. Oh. <laughs> I'll never forget that. I've often tried to get a hold of her, but I never was able to. And she held my hand all the way to school. And then I forget the rest, of course. But I just thought to myself, okay, we might like not uh, see it that way, but that really is how it is as adults, okay? With Moses, with the disciples, and uh, we need that assurance that God is actually there holding our hand all the way. Amen. Amen. Okay, so we, we have a time of, of prayer if you uh, have a prayer request, please feel free to, to speak it. Heavenly Father, too, we also lift those unspoken requests that we all have that are just too private to share, but you understand them. And uh, we just pray, Lord God, as we lift them to you, that our hopes would be lifted and uh, we would know uh, that you are working on these things on our behalf. We pray and we ask, Lord God, that you continue to be with us in this year's service. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, church, how are we doing? Good. 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 We're here, and he's here. Uh, just a couple quick little announcement things before we jump into the Word. Um, had our regular board meeting yesterday and uh, gathered together virtually on Zoom. It's always a good thing that we can just gather wherever we're at. And just talking over things about what's happening here at the church. Very excited about stuff. Uh, talked about our uh, funds from the garage sale and how to be wise with those. And we've, uh, we're have we going to give 50% of those funds to a local charity. And we're going to clarify that with those who worked so hard to put all that together as to where that's going to go. And uh, we'd like to uh, see that happen soon. Uh, we also talked about getting together, not at the beach at the end of this month, like we maybe had mentioned before, but we're going to have a gathering up at the Benti's home. Uh, we're going to trust that that can happen on September the 8th, and so we're going to bring our service up to Shawnigan and uh, have a time of there. So we're letting you know now, so you have lots of time to prepare, lots of time to find directions, lots of time to work on uh, getting together and uh, working on a way to get up there so we can carpool and do all that and have a great time celebrating at their home. More details to come. And uh, as well as just uh, really, we, we talked a little bit about identity. Who are we as, as the church? Because of, you know, we are a blended family. And it's a beautiful thing. You know, the word says it's a beautiful thing when brothers come together in peace and harmony, right? It's, it's a beautiful thing. The church is beautiful. Uh, but what do we call it? Um, other than the church, right? So we, we've been West Shore community. We've been Victoria Christian faith. Um, just so you're aware, uh, so everyone knows, that charter, that... Um, charitable status and the name of, of VCFC uh, is now under the covership of our conference, the VC Baptist Conference, in the hopes that another church plant somewhere in British Columbia can pick up that charter and, and launch with that. And so that has kind of, you know, that, that number and all has moved on. But so, so who are we? we? We're still West Shore, right? We're, we're here in the West Shore. Yeah. And so we're, we're likely going to keep identifying that way. Uh, for the future. If you've got questions, your thoughts, or ideas about that, come and see Pastor Ron. Come and see me, and uh, we can talk about it, or any one of our board members, and let's just talk about that. If there's any particular way you might feel drawn or led by the Lord in that, do let us know. But uh, we're going to just keep kind of being West Shore for now, West Shore Community Church, and uh, because that's really kind of where we're at, right? Does that make sense? Yeah. Awesome. If you have thoughts about that, do discuss those with us and let us know. Did I miss anything, Madam Chairman? <laughs> Sue is now our chair of the board, just in case you had any questions. So if you need to talk about Ron or I, no, I'm kidding. Yes. Bring it to Sue. <laughs> Praise God. Speaking of God, where is he? Everywhere. Everywhere. People oh. often ask that question, don't they? Where's God? Everywhere. If there's a God, where, well, where is he? Show me God. Maybe we've even asked it ourselves sometimes. God, where are you? I have. We have done that. I know we have. 
People have come up with all sorts of ideas and answers about where God is and maybe who God is. One of those things is that God is distant. Is. God's out there somewhere. Somewhere. He's, he's uncaring. He leaves us on our own. He's uninterested, uninvolved, aware but not participating in our world. Songs like From a Distance. You ever heard that one? Right? Mm -hmm. God is watching us. God is watching us. Now it's going to be in your head for the rest of the service, you know. But he's watching us where? From a distance. That's sad. It's an awfully sad song. Some may think that God is cruel. Cruel in not being present with us and being that pillar of fire or that pillar of cloud that the Israelites had while they wandered in the wilderness. Where is God? Psh, right there. Right? Here's this cloud. Here's God's presence. Maybe that would help us to identify with him a little bit, that he's right there. But maybe because we think that he's not here, we don't see him. That, that's a cruel thing. He just allows humanity to work its evil, and he just sits back and does nothing. Another view is that God is an unknowable, Force that we cannot relate to. So beyond us that we can't possibly think that we could understand, comprehend, and least of all have any kind of relationship with God. Some may think of God as a last resort. Some kind of superhero who swoops in just at the last moment, just when we need them, we cry out for help. He shows up in the nick of time and then disappears. He's your friendly neighborhood God. God just doesn't care, though. Is that true? No. Could it be that even believers in Christ, Christians, have some thoughts like these about God, or maybe some mixture of them at times, depending on our circumstance? Are there true concepts? Are these ideas that I mentioned, are these actual concepts of the Spirit whom we gather to worship when we come here, when we come together wherever we are as the church, to pray, to worship in song, to open his word, or at home in our own quiet times, what we read about in the pages of scripture and attempt to share with those who have no belief in God at all. Where is God? What God? God, where are you? When I go through struggles like that, God, where are you? And I do. There's times when I, I, I wonder, where, God, where are you in this circumstance? There's a passage that I've often referred to in my heart, in my life, and open the pages of and reread to remind myself that God is very present. The, the God who made heaven and earth and the universe, he's right here. And he's in the midst of every circumstance, good or bad. He is the one I have found that I can put my faith and my trust and all my hope and my very life in his hands. And it's found in the Old Testament. In one of the minor prophets' writings some 600 years before Christ was born in Bethlehem. Found in the book of Zephaniah. How often do you sneak in there? Zephaniah was a voice for the Lord at a time when Josiah had been reigning in Jerusalem. How old was Josiah when he started reigning? Anyone know? Eight, Eight years old. Yeah. He was a little boy. And as he grew up and became this king of Israel, he discovered something when they were cleaning up the temple. They found a book, an old, old book. And the prophet brought it to Josiah and he read it in his presence and Josiah wept and tore his clothes and says, what have we been doing? We've been ignoring God's law that he gave to Moses, that he gave to our forefathers. And this book that Zephaniah wrote was a, a proclamation of judgment on those who had served false gods, who turned from the right, who knew what they ought to do but didn't do it. The early chapters of this prophecy describe a time when God is going to just wipe the earth clean. I'm done with you. It's scary when God's angry. 
But this prophecy does not end in God's wrath and his wiping out of everyone, including us. As much as God has a right to be angry with this world and maybe upset with us, his anger does not last forever. For God is not an unrighteous judge, nor is he out for revenge. He's not uncaring. He's not loving. And most of all, he is not distant, far away and unknowable. God is with us. And we live and need to live each day in his presence. And so I'm going to ask you if you've got your Bible, turn to Zephaniah. That's the fourth book from the end of the Old Testament. And we're going to explore a little bit about where God is. What God will do in our everyday lives. And I've asked Stephanie to come and read our passage for us this morning. Zephaniah 3, and we're looking at verses uh, 14 through 20. Sing aloud, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O Israel. Rejoice and exult with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away the judgments against you. He has cleared away your enemies. The King of Israel, the Lord, is in your midst. You shall never again fear evil. On that day it shall be said to Jerusalem, Fear not, O Zion, let not your hands grow weak. The Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. He will exult over you with loud singing. I will gather those of you who mourn for the festival, so that you will no longer suffer reproach. Behold, at that time, I will deal with all your oppressors, and I will save the lame and gather the outcast, and I will change their shame into praise and renown in all the earth. At that time, I will bring you in, at the time when I gather you together, for I will make you renowned and praised among all the peoples of the earth, when I restore your fortunes before your eyes, says the Lord. God is with you. You ever done something wrong and felt really, really bad about it afterward? Yeah. Or right in the midst of it? Yeah. Knowing that you're going to have to make up for your mistake mm -hmm. and face the consequences mm -hmm. for your wrongdoing? It feels awful inside, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. When you know you've done something wrong. It's stressful, worrying, Maybe even painful. But here in the midst of a prophecy about judgment and wrath on all of those who have offended God, we're told to sing, to shout, to rejoice and exult. Because God has taken the judgment that we deserve, that the, the people of Israel who had turned away from Him, those who had followed false gods for so long, He's taken the judgment we deserve away. Knowing we had done wrong, God takes it away. So we don't have to fear the evil, the judgment, the punishment. We don't have to fear our enemies, he says. We don't have to fear anything. We just don't have to fear. Even like an old president once said, the only thing to fear is Fear itself. And we don't have to fear it. Why? How? Someone who's done something wrong must surely have to pay for what they've done. Right? That's what we call justice. You do something wrong, you pay the consequence. You steal the little car from Kmart, you gotta go take it back. You stole that chocolate bar from the grocery store, you're going back and paying for it ten times over. I see people's heads nodding and saying, yeah, I've been there, done that. That lie you told is going to mess you up. Those taxes you cheated on, they're going to find out. That extra change you got from the teller when you gave him a 50 and they gave you, you know, way too much back, you better go back and repay it. I'm sure we can all relate to times of being punished as children for some kind of bad behavior. 
Then we got old and adultish. We said, well, I don't have to get punished anymore. Now I get to dole it out. <laughs> no. No, we receive justice for our wrongdoings. Some a little more tender than the others. Right? Spare the rod, spoil the child. Anyone have the rod spared? Or did they not hold back at all? You know? <laughs> our children feared the wooden spoon. We didn't beat our kids, but they knew if they got and in trouble that there might be a little pat on the backside with the wooden spoon after the count of one, two, and then they behaved. Because right? they knew three, you know, three had to be it. As a parent, you had to be consistent. We tried to be. And so I can still today, even to our 33-year-old daughter, one, I go, two, she still says, and I, all, all those memories come back. All of our kids know. Because they know that bad behavior had consequences. Why is it we forget that as adults? Why is it we forget that as followers of the king? How is it that sinful people, hurtful people, wrongdoing, stiff-necked, evil, unrighteous, perverted, hating, hurting, disobedient, God-defying people be free of the kind of justice that we deserve? How could a righteous God allow that to happen? How can he just take it away? Shouldn't there be a price? Shouldn't there be justice against all those who have offended God? Those who have spoken against Him? Those who have spoken against the church? Maybe those who have spoken against you personally and called you out for something about your faith and said, you're just this whatever, they give, you know, plug in whatever names you want. Should there not be justice for all of these? A price for all the hurt that's been caused, including you and I, and the hurt that we may have caused to others things that we've been subjected to at the hands of others, maybe even those we consider close to us? The answer is yes. Absolutely yes. Sin has a price. But the glorious answer also is the price has been paid. It's been paid in full. Is God just? Absolutely. Through God's sacrificial atoning death of Himself on the cross in the person of Jesus Christ, sin is paid for. How much? All of it. All sin. Every sin. My sins. Your sins. The sins of all humanity. It's been covered. It's been paid for. Justice has been served on Christ. By the suffering and death that He bore on our behalf as humanity. For anything and everything we might have done or might yet do. Isn't that amazing? I had a thought, we were sitting in a restaurant yesterday and having a little meal, and there was this tweaking in the back of my head. God does this every now and then. I haven't even mentioned this to Stephanie yet. And I'm sitting there thinking in my chair, look at all these people around and what they're doing and what they're talking about. You can hear conversations. Some are pretty, some are pretty ugly. But here's all these people and they all have, they're sitting here having a meal and they all owe a price for their meal. What if I was to stand up in the midst of that restaurant and say, hello everyone, you all have a debt here. Everyone owes this restaurant for the meal you're about to consume or have already consumed. All the stuff that you're putting into yourself, you gotta pay for it all. How about I pay for it? I'll pay for every single meal in this restaurant. Would you accept that offer? How many do you think would? Every single one. <clears throat> And they'd put another round on and they'd order an extra set of fries and desserts and all this stuff. It would all pour on, right? It's all covered. And it would be wonderful. They might even look up to me and say thank you. They might. I don't know. But here's a thought. Second phrase I would say, folks, you all owe a debt. Because we have all sinned against Almighty God. We all owe Him for the wrongs that we have done. But guess what? It's been paid for. It's covered. And God offers you forgiveness if you will simply say, I repent and I believe. How many will take up that offer? They come and punch you. Exactly. 
We, the world turns its back on the most glorious offer ever given. They'll gladly take a free lunch. But how often will people accept the sacrificial atoning death of Jesus Christ on the cross to cover their sin so that they may have eternal life and they turn their back on it? All the ones that I wonder. Throws. I wonder why that is. Why is there so much selfishness in the human heart that we think that somehow we don't need God? And we've just made God distant. We've made God unknowable. We as humanity have made God something to be ignored. Because of this amazing, gracious, inexplicable gift of Christ's death, anyone who does put their faith in Jesus can and will have eternal life instead of eternal punishment. Because God is just. And for those who have received Christ and said yes to His grace, absolutely, they are forgiven and eternal life is afforded them forever. That's a double positive. That was bad English. I apologize for that. <laughs> Talk about a reason to sing and shout and exult and let the praises ring out. And not just sit back and go, I'm saved. And I don't need to do nothing. When is the last time that we can say honestly, that with all of our heart, verse 14, that we have exalted the name of God for the forgiveness of sin that we have through Christ's death and resurrection, where we've given Him a hallelujah! Thank you, Lord! I don't deserve this kind of grace! One of my favorite lines from A Christmas Carol is when Scrooge is sitting there in his office at the very end, he's sent off his partner to go just get some more coal and have a nice cup of rum punch. And he says, I don't deserve to be this happy. And we don't, but we are. We have been given everything. We've been given eternal life. And yet we can sit back and, and be some of the most glum looking people on the planet. Why is that? We may sing, but do we sing songs of praise just half-heartedly? Is our worship coming from the very depths of who we are when we think about lifting up the name of Almighty God? Have we exalted the name of God? Or are we just casual Christians who just think, well, I showed up in church today, that ought to be good enough. I put a couple coins in the offering plate. I bowed my head and prayed and looked around just a little bit while people were praying. I'm wondering what time the game is on. How long is the sermon going to go? Got to get back to something else. You know, I got things to do, places to be. I'm good or are we sold out to Jesus? Is our life absolutely His? So that whatever comes our way, good, bad, ugly, doesn't matter. God is good all the time and all the time. God is good. Amen. Are we given out heart and soul to the one who bought us at such a great price? Amen. Do we really give him all the glory for the great things he's done? There's a good hymn we should sing almost every week, right? To God be the glory, great things he has done. So loved he the world that he gave us his son who yielded his life an atonement for sin and open the life gates so all may go in. Do we really praise the Lord? This is who God is. He is the King of Israel, the King of the earth, the King of the universe, the one who created earth and came to earth to be with us. Emmanuel. God with us. That's his name. And by his spirit, he is here. And he is with us. And yes, he came physically. And guess what? He's coming again. And at one day, every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess on the earth and under the earth. Everyone who's been born, everyone who's lived, died, ever been is going to bow their knee and say, Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And then he's going to take his church home. And those who have not accepted receive eternal punishment 
in a lake of fire because God is also just. He is with us. He is in our midst. And thanks, Yvonne, for putting that song in there today. He is here. Now. Not just Sundays at 10 or evenings when we might get together and, and pray and read the word. He's not just with us when we think about it. No, he's always with us. There's not a circumstance you could possibly be in that God is not there. Does that change the way we think about the way we live? We live the way we think? How we conduct ourselves in everything? Knowing that God Almighty is right here. Would it change our attitudes if there was a pillar of fire right here? We've sort of been talking about, you know, at the board level, like, what should we name the church? Pillar of fire! <laughs> because it would make us wake up. If God's presence was there, if this pillar of cloud, and we got some cloud today, if we were always thinking, this is God with us, would it not change us in the way we conduct ourselves, the way we work, live and worship here, and the way we live when we leave this place? Knowing that that God, that same God is with us everywhere. He is not distant. But we don't need to fear him either. If we have faith and trust in him. Sure we have things to deal with in life. I never said, God never said, Jesus never said that life would be easy just because we believe. No, in this world you will have trouble. But take heart. I've overcome the world. Do you believe that? Yes. If so, if we really believe that God is with us wherever we go, that his promise to never leave or forsake us is true, does it affect the way that we live day in and day out, circumstance to circumstance, trial to trial, victory to victory, from the day you first believed until we breathe our last breath? Folks, we live in the presence of God. God is not far off somewhere so that when we pray, we've got to talk real loud so He hears us. Not He's not deaf. The prophet made fun of the other prophets of Baal when they were praying and trying to bring fire down from heaven. He said, oh, maybe you need to yell a little now or maybe your God's off on the toilet. And all he had to do was say, God, creator of the universe, show us who you really are. Boom. When we live in the presence of God, that knowledge and that understanding ought to affect everything we do, yes? Yeah. Everything. There is no circumstance, no decision, no action, no plan, no dream, no work thing we have to do, no day we drive, no day we work, no day we rest, no day we do anything, that we shouldn't have this sense of awe that God is right there. A feeling of comfort and the deepest of reverence, all at the same time. Knowing God is one of the most emotionally and sensory overwhelming things that we could experience in, as humans in this present form that we're in. This body can't really comprehend what it is truly like. One day we will. One day we will be with him. One day we will be like him. And one day we will see him as he is. But until that day, here we are. And so we come to verse 17. We come to what gives me and what can give you and what can give anyone this great comfort in whatever we're facing in life, whatever circumstance. And I think of these statements that he makes in this verse as God's I will statements. There are ten of them in this passage that Stephanie read for us this morning. We're going to look at my favorite four. Found in this one verse, Zephaniah 3.17. The first is, the Lord who is with you will save you. God's not weak, he is mighty, right? He's not a wimp, he's a warrior. He's not going to let us be lost, he will save us. He says, I will do this. He will save us from sin, save us from the enemy, save us from fear, save us from the lies, and lead us to truth and set us free to everlasting life. God will save you. 
Death has no victory over Christ, and we so therefore we don't have to fear death ourselves. It's just a stepping stone to eternity with Christ. God will save. Secondly, He will rejoice over you with gladness. There's the concept. Parents ought to be their kids' most exuberant cheerleaders in life, right? Whether it's a sporting event, a new task they've completed, a test of their knowledge, or a, a challenge they've overcome, parents are the ones who are thrilled to see their little ones taking it on and succeeding, or even failing and trying again, and trying again, and they're always there cheering them on. You go, kid. That's my kid. That's my boy. My little girl did that. Yay! Anyone watch Olympics at all in the last few weeks? We saw a bit. Used to watch it all, and now it's like, uh, I don't need to see it all. But there was one thing that did stand out to me. And those are the parents of a young woman named Summer McIntosh. Yep. Swimmer. Swimmer, yes. <laughs> Won three gold medals. She's like 17 years old. And if you saw pictures of her parents in the stands, every time she swam and she was winning, or even when she didn't, and she didn't win all her races, but when she was racing, her parents were up there just jumping, go, 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 and they're yelling, go, Summer, go, Summer. Tears pouring from their eyes and just cheering the kid on. They were so happy for her, living vicariously through the success of their child and having a grand time celebrating that she was doing so well. But guess what? Every parent who was there, every swimmer in every lane, whether they won or came in last, were thrilled to see that their child was there in that pool swimming or on that track racing, or throwing that hammer, or throwing the javelin, or jumping, or running, or even break dancing. apparently. It's all in there. And people were thrilled, and they were cheering their kids on. And guess what? God is your biggest fan. He says, I will rejoice over you. He longs for us to do well in life. He desires you to succeed, not just in the temporary things of this world, but in the eternal things of his kingdom. I think the caffeine's kicking in. God is thrilled to see us run this race. Whether we have full success in everything or not, he just loves cheering us on. You go, kid! He loves it. When we try, when we work, when we, when we go out and work for his kingdom and do all these sort of things, when we succeed in obedience to his word, to conforming to the character of his son and sharing his love and his hope and his message and the gospel with others, it makes God so happy, so glad to have us as his children. Can you imagine God going, go, go, go? He wants us to do well. He will rejoice over you. You want to make your Heavenly Father happy? And hear Him one day say those words, those reassuring words, well done, good and faithful servant. And God claps. He rejoices over you. Thirdly, He will quiet you by His love. He will. Perhaps the greatest thing that humanity searches for in life is to be loved. The greatest pursuits that we have, the deepest desire of our heart is that someone loves me. People everywhere, in whatever part of the world and whatever circumstance of life they might find themselves in, long to be and want to be loved, to share love, to know real love. We will seek it out, long for it, even obsess over the ingrained need that we have to be loved. Sometimes to the point of fear and doubt that maybe nobody does. That's loneliness. If we feel we're not loved. But God says he'll quiet you and give you peace by his love. Does it matter if the world loves you? No. No. The world might hate you, but even Jesus said, if the world hates you, remember, it hated me first. We can be at peace. We can be still and know that he is God. We can find rest in the knowledge that God, the God, the only God, the God of the universe, loves us, loves you. God loves you.
God who is the very definition of love, 1 John 4 tells us, God is love. He is absolutely, completely, and eternally in love with you. He made you, formed you, knit you together in your mother's womb. Think about that for a moment. God knows every speck of DNA in your body because he put it there. Made you just the way you are because he loves you. He formed you and breathed life into you and he gave his life for you. Greater love has no one, no one than this, that one lay down his life for his friends. Jesus says, guess what? You're my friends. You're my friends. If you do what I command. Now what he commanded is to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and love your neighbor as yourself. But that is exactly what God did for us in laying down his life for us. And knowing that, knowing that you are perfectly loved should bring peace. A calming, reassuring, everlasting, all circumstance, spirit quietening peace. Here's a challenge for you. Every day you wake up, and everyone here woke up this morning. We might be falling asleep right now, but we're, we woke up. When you wake up every day, say this for the next week. The first thought that you get up with, God loves me. And see how that changes your perspective on the day ahead. There might be some awful circumstances waiting for you at work. There might be something you've got to make a decision on that's weighing on your heart real heavy. There might be debts that are piling up. There might be family issues that are going on. There might be disease. There might be struggle. There might be worry and fret about others in your family or others around you and neighbors and all the stuff that goes on in the world. The wars, the, the hunger, the natural disasters. It all seems terrible, but don't let that be your first thought. Let your first thought be, God loves Because that changes everything. The world may hate you, but God loves you. The world will pass away, but God's love will never diminish or fade. You are loved. And fourthly, He loves you so much. He rejoices over you so much. He saves you to eternal life and simply cannot hold in his feelings. So God will, underline that, exult over you with loud singing. I love that statement. Talk about a reason to write a hymn that in my heart there rings a melody, rings a melody with heaven's harmony. God will exult over you with loud singing. Why don't you close your eyes for a moment? Don't fall asleep. But think. Try and imagine that kind of reaction. Do you have a picture of God in your mind, whatever that might be, His presence, His glorious throne, His eternal dwelling place in heaven? but also with us, right beside you, right now. The king of the universe, the creator, the lover of your soul is singing over you. Can you hear his voice? Can you hear the resonance of his song? Can you appreciate the poetry of his words, the rhythm of the chorus, the never-ending, perfectly pitched, harmonious song of the Holy Trinity singing? over you. We sing, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. We are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. He sings, I love you. Put your name in. This I know. 
I gave him the word. I told you so. You might be weak, but I'm strong, and I'm with you all day long. And he's singing this because he loves you, because he's so proud of you, just being you. He's with you over and over in the pages of Scripture. We're reminded of God's love for us. Over and over, we need to hear him singing over us. Imagine these walls resonating with God's voice, the melodious tone of his surely baritone voice. And it rings in your heart, in your mind, and in your thoughts. Who loves a good love song? God's written one for you. Who likes to rock it out? God can do that with you. Who loves the poetry songs? The story songs? He's got one with your name on it. This is God. We need to know that today. In a world where Things are hard. It's hard to see all the pain and the struggle in the world. It's hard to see people living life as if God doesn't exist because they don't know Him yet. But when we think about the fact that God is with us, that He saves us, that He rejoices over us, and that He sings over us because of His love, living in God's presence is knowing that, knowing that He loves us. And we live each day sharing that love with others. So that they too can hear the song of Almighty God being sung over them. Can I close with just a few reminders of God's love? And Stephanie, I'm going to put you to work one more time if you wouldn't mind. And hand one of these to everyone here, please. These are just a few reminders of God's love for us. And I want you to take these home and put them somewhere where you're going to see them all the time. Maybe it's in the middle of your Bible. Maybe it's on your fridge. Maybe it's by where you charge your phone or your computer or where the TV remote sits. I don't care where you put it, but I want you to see this every day. Because we need to know this and hear this and be reminded of this, that for God so loved the world, He gave His one and only Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish but have eternal life. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever doesn't know God, or who does not love, doesn't know God, because God is love. This is how God showed His love among us. He sent His one and only Son into the world that we might live through Him. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also, also ought to love one another. And so we know and rely on the love that God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. In all these things, we're more than conquerors through Him who loved us. For I'm convinced that neither death nor life, angels or demons, the present or the future, the powers of any kind, neither height nor depth nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Though the mountains be shaken and the hills be removed, and there was a mountain that blew up in Russia this morning. Did you hear about that? Big earthquake. Volcano blows up. Though the mountains be shaken, the hills be removed, yet my unfailing love for you will not be shaken, nor my covenant of peace be removed, says the Lord, who has compassion on you. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. I have been crucified with Christ. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. 
Give thanks to the God of heaven. His love endures forever. And because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. But you, Lord, are a compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. And so see what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world doesn't know us is that it did not know Him. Greater love has no one than this, to lay one's life down for one's friends. Know, therefore, that the Lord your God is God. He's the faithful God, keeping His covenant of love to a thousand generations of those who love Him and keep His commandments. This, this is the God who's with us. God who loves us so much that He sings. And the words of His love song are found in all the pages of this book. That's his love letter to you. That's his love song over you. He reminds you of who he is, of how much he cares, and all that he's done and is yet to do. It's all here. Why? Because God's with you, and God loves you. Let's pray. Lord, what a privilege to be your children. That's what we are. And I pray that as we Lift up your name, whether it's in song, in prayer, in conversation, or in the quietness of our heart. That we would do so acknowledging, first of all, who you are. You're the God who's here with us. And you love us. You are all powerful, all just, all holy, all righteous, and all love. And you're here. So God, I pray that we would acknowledge that in the way that we praise you. In the way that we lift up your name. In the way that we live our lives in your presence. You're not far away. You're very close. To the brokenhearted and to the rejoicing. To those in need and those with abundance to those worrying about tomorrow and those rejoicing over the moment of today. You're here. You hear us. You know everything we're going through and you care because you are amazing. So God, we want to trust you in this moment and we want to trust you for the next one. We want to trust you with all of our ins and outs, our comings and goings, everything. May our lives truly be given wholly to you because you gave your whole life for us. So help us to acknowledge that, live it out, and proclaim it to this world so that so many more might come to know you as the God who is here, the God who sings and saves and exalts over us because he loves us. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I hope you can join us for some fellowship in the hall afterward. Maybe we can discuss over what songs draw us all closer to the Lord. Let's stand together.
in leaving, well, uh, share some words from John 14, verses 15 and 16. If you love me, you will keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever. Bless God's word. dismissed. Have a wonderful rest of today and know that God is with you now and always.